Welcome to Breaking Through Health Barriers. This is your host, Dr. Terry Wenner, bringing you education, motivation, and inspiration for healthy living. I'm an educator, a registered nurse, a podcaster, a blogger, and a video creator, and I'm so glad you decided to listen in today. Today we have episode 11, and in this three-part episode, we'll be discussing the types of tea that are available and how they benefit our health, randomized controlled trials, and the importance of scheduling routine checkups. So let's get started. Our first topic today is the health benefits of tea. You know, several years ago, when I began to watch the amount of calories that I ate and drank throughout the day, one thing that I did pretty quickly was to eliminate the majority of calories from beverages. This opened my eyes to the world of tea drinking, and presently I don't add sugar, milk, or any types of sweeteners to my tea. I just enjoy the calorie-free taste of the plain tea. And in addition to enjoying my tea, I've also been reading a lot of information online. I've been seeing it pop up all over the place about the health benefits of tea. So not only did it help reduce my calorie intake and give me something that was, you know, tasty to drink, I also found something that has a lot of health benefits also. So I um, thought that it would be a good thing for us to explore together. So let's get started with a little discussion about the dangers of free radicals. So, you know, I I do have some science background, but I'm certainly not a scientist uh, or a biologist. And some of these things uh, are a little tricky to understand, but I'm going to try to explain things in ways that are easy for us all to grasp hold of and that we can actually use, not just, you know, listen to a bunch of um, difficult to understand things. So... For starters, free radicals. Uh, I was looking at WebMD, which I do believe is a very credible site, and they gave a basic definition of free radicals, and they said that free radicals are atoms or molecules that have at least one unpaired electron. So what does that mean? Well, that means that it makes them more prone to react with certain chemicals, and that can cause the cells to be unstable and not to function normally. So that's what we really care about. We don't want non-functional cells, right? There are some experts out there who study older adults, and they believe in what's called the free radical theory of aging. And that basically states that free radical damage is a major factor in age-related health problems. And as we age, as we get older, free radical damage in the body can even be higher. So that's really what they're talking about. This damage is causing us to have problems with our health. So the question is, how are we exposed to free radicals and can we do anything about reducing that? Well, there's basically, um, you know, there's a lot of ways you can be exposed, but there's three main categories. One, you can't do anything about. It's a normal byproduct of normal processes such as digestion. So obviously we're not, you know, planning on interfering with digestion. So that could be a possible outcome to have free radicals from normal digestion and other body processes. The second major way is that when the body breaks down certain medications, it can also create free radicals. But once again, if we need medications for other purposes, the benefits outweigh the risks, and we're not worried about free radicals. We're worried about how the medicine can help us. And then the last one is through pollutants such as heavy metal and smoke. So obviously this is one we do have a little control over. If you smoke, you can quit or at least you know, reduce your um, amount of smoking significantly. And we always are looking out for healthy ways to um, avoid pollution, right? So that's gonna be something that we can do something about. So how do we fight it? Are we just left to deal with this? No, so the good news is there are ways that you can fight back. You can fight free radical damage. So we can't always totally avoid being exposed, but on the other hand, we don't have to sit by and silently do nothing either. There's molecules called antioxidants that can help stabilize free radicals. So antioxidants are all over the news, all over the TV, all over the internet. And antioxidants, they do come naturally in many of the foods that we eat, primarily fruits and vegetables. So that's one of the reasons we're always encouraging people to eat enough fruits and vegetables. But you can also get them as supplements. 
And then here's the good news that ties in with our topic today. They are also found in many teas. So all over tea boxes, uh, you know, in the stores, you will see these advertisements, you know, antioxidants, antioxidants, antioxidants. That is great news for us because it helps fight free radical damage, which in theory, one of the theories is it might help you prevent diseases that are occur with older aging, right? So. There's not 100% proof that all of this happens. So that's why they continue to call these theories. There are actually, when I was teaching the older adult course, I believe there's probably about 12 or 13 theories of aging and the free radical theory is only one of them. But if it's going to be something that helps us, you know, why not give it a try? Give ourselves the, you know, the benefit of that. All right, so getting a little bit deeper into tea, what does it do for us? So besides the free radical benefit, there are a lot, lots of information out there about the general benefits of tea. I can remember being a, a young girl and having tea parties with my friends. There are many, you know, places that you can go, tea houses and things like that, go out for a cup of tea, uh, breakfast with tea, different things like that. So there's, you may find this interesting. According to the Tea Association of the United States of America Incorporated, daily tea drinkers number about 158 million or half the U.S. population. I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like a heck of a lot of tea drinkers. So there's a whole lot of tea drinking going on. Some of the general benefits of drinking tea, and this is according to a one of the registered dietitians, Neva Cochran. And Neva writes that tea drinking has the ability to soothe. It restores and refreshes. It has heart health benefits, cancer prevention benefits. It promotes healthy teeth aids in weight loss and often has less caffeine than coffee now i do caution you every type of tea has a different amount of caffeine some are very low some have large amounts of caffeine so it can't be a blanket statement that it always has less but it often does have less okay so you know that's kind of an overall picture of how tea can benefit us and i don't know about you but all those things sound great to me you know i could always use a little more soothing restoring refreshing and uh, help with weight loss and pre prevention of many different kinds of problems so you know we can dig even further into this what types of tea are out there and what specifically do they do for us you know i've always been curious about this topic i think in part we have a tendency to like the tastes of certain teas but there may be for health reasons choices that are better than others so there's uh, some information that i found on the berkeley wellness website they put up this great infographic that sort of spelled out the major benefits of tea so i'm going to highlight a few of them today there are many other resources online you could dig further into this and get much more information and you won't hear every single type of tea that you know about to be on this list because they often categorize them in more general terms rather than listing specific tea types so they often go with colors and and major categories like that so you know the first one is actually white tea white tea is the least processed and it has the least caffeine but they do feel that it is protective against cancer so that is one of the benefits of white tea. Uh, green tea, on the other hand, comes with a long list. They say it has very negligible amounts of caffeine and high concentration of antioxidants. So we just talked about that. Mean, that means green tea is going to fight against those free radicals that can damage our bodies. So they go on to say that green tea is protective against many things. And this is a little bit similar to the list I read just a minute ago preventative in cancer, tooth decay, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, burning fat and promoting weight loss, and improving cholesterol levels. So once again, an awesome list. Everybody wants to run out and buy green tea now, but I do want to caution you. Uh, there's a word of caution. Even though the caffeine is very minimal in green tea, it does still have caffeine. So there are certain diseases that are aggravated by caffeine and your physician or healthcare provider may have told you no caffeine. In this case, you're not gonna run out and buy green tea. You're gonna use your doctor or healthcare provider's advice and kind of steer clear of it. 
Um, so, you know, a best practice all the time when it comes to various teas is to make sure that your primary care provider is aware of what you're taking, making sure it won't interfere with other medications that you have uh, been taking or conditions that you have. You know, so although in many cases tea is not going to hurt you, there are situations where it could. So be honest with your doctors, you know, get, get that information out there to them. Um, Olong tea is another one. This has less caffeine than black. We haven't talked about black tea yet, but I believe it has a little bit more than green. And it's thought to protect against tooth decay and also may help cholesterol levels. Black tea is the most processed and most caffeinated. Its taste is stronger than green or Olong tea. Might be Oolong tea. I might not be pronouncing that right. Next we have Ruibus or red tea. So now we're actually entering a, a new thing here. Ruibus tea is actually not considered true tea because it is made from a South African herb, not a specific plant that is required to be considered tea. Regardless though, whether or not it's true tea or not, it is thought to be protective against cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so if you're not familiar with that term, we're talking about things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, where the nerves in the body are seeing degeneration. Uh, the nervous systems in the body are degenerating. And in the majority of cases, that's not reversible. Sometimes we can slow down the progress, but we can't reverse it. So it is actually found that ruibus tea or red tea may have some protection against that. And then our last category here is the herbal teas. So this group of tea is made from herbs, fruit, seed, or root, roots that are steeped in hot water. And again, this category is also not considered true tea, but has shown many health benefits, especially in chronic conditions like diabetes. Um, so a word of caution has been kind of issued by the WebMD uh, site on um, the caution of teas. And we basically, what they're saying is you always want to check the label for what you purchase and ingest. There are companies out there that when they make teas, they add things to it, um, especially instant teas. They may have put all kinds of things in, in instant teas, but one example is a product called Senna, S-E-N-N-A. Senna is a laxative. We often give it in pill form in the hospital settings, um, but this is something that can be put in tea. Well, it really should only be taken if it's recommended by your healthcare provider that you should be taking it, and it's usually for people with um, uncontrollable constipation issues. Uh, so certainly constipation issues are first dealt with with food, you know, high fiber foods, good hydration, but there are times when those are not enough to control it. But this really should be a prescription, even though it's available over the counter. Um, so you do have to be cautious about that. Also, uh, this is my little note, you have to be careful that you're not drinking things you're allergic to. So if you have a lot of outdoor allergies to pollens and ragweeds and different kinds of flowers and things like that, you may have problems with teas that are made with different kinds of herbs and fruits and seeds and roots and things like that. So, you know, you gotta keep a lookout for that kind of thing. One example is chamomile is a plant from the daisy family and many people might have you know allergic reactions to that so based upon all this information the, the next question is so what kind of tea should we drink you know there's lots of good choices out there lots of options some are going to taste better to you than others but when it really comes down to it i have to say there is much research being done on teas and how beneficial they are to us. And I expect that this will continue in the near future, that we'll see more and more research coming out about the benefits of tea. In the meanwhile, what I recommend is that you focus on the areas of health that you either already have problems or are likely, because of your genetic makeup, to have problems. So, you know, if neurodegenerative diseases tend to run in your family, and that's something that you're really worried about, then giving ruibus tea might be a really good thing for you. But as I mentioned, always check with your healthcare provider first to make sure it's safe for you as an individual. Personally, I like a lot of different kinds of teas. I, I had company recently and they saw my tea shelf. They're like, oh, I guess you like tea. Yes, I actually have learned to love tea 
and I don't stick to just one kind. I kind of mix it up. I drink the types of tea that have more caffeine in the earlier part of the day and in the late afternoon to evening I often drink the non-caffeinated ones or ones with very low caffeine often finishing up the evening with chamomile tea. So I hope that gave you some great information about all the different types of benefits that can come from tea and I hope you'll give them a try if you haven't already been in Uh, a tea drinker. Okay, the next part of our episode today is Dr. Terry's health tip and challenge of the week. So this week, I want to make sure that you have plans to have all your routine screenings done. So um, the frequency varies from person to person, so it's not like I can tell everyone to do the same thing. What I encourage you to do is to do what your doctors or healthcare providers have already told you. You know, some types of checkups, for example, the annual physical, uh, the majority of us do need an annual physical. But if your physician or healthcare provider has told you that you don't need it that frequently, then go as frequently as they said, but make sure you get that scheduled. So I have to admit to you, I start a new job very soon and I don't really know what kind of flexibility I'll have with my schedule. And I know I'm due to schedule this checkup, but I don't know when to schedule it. So I have to keep that on my radar. I have to keep that out in front of me or before you know it, I'll be long past a year and won't have made it over to that checkup. Um, You know, the reason that we encourage checkups so much is that they sometimes can prevent a problem. And if you can't prevent it, certainly we want to find it early so that we can start treatment promptly. The longer you let things go, the worse they are. And sometimes there are changes in our bodies or our health that are obvious. You know, you you see this wart that has changed into this large object uh, that seems to be attached to your skin somewhere. That's an obvious thing. But do you know what's going on inside your colon? Probably not, right? Unless you have blood coming out or can't go to the bathroom at all, you may not know what's going on inside your colon or inside your heart or your lungs. So take advantage of these services that are often covered by your insurance and find out if you have something going on. Uh, Another common checkup that we often forget about is dental checkups. Every six months you should be going as long as you have the ability to have that that type of care. And even if you don't have insurance or money is tight, there are often places that offer free or discount dental work as well. Uh, If you haven't thought about this before, many times there are dental hygienists or dental schools that offer uh, very inexpensive or free services. Sometimes they're not as conveniently located or the times are not ideal and you may have to wait in line uh, for your turn, but there are options, so don't ignore it. Once again, I'm guilty of not being up to par on this either. I had an appointment scheduled and it landed during my work hours for my first week on my new job. So I did call and cancel that. And because they don't want to push me off for another six months, I'm on a waiting list. But at least that's a a work in progress and hopefully I'll get that in soon. Some specialty things. Women definitely should be getting regular breast and pelvic exams. Vision for most people that are 18 to 60. It's recommended that you get an eye exam every two years. That's provided that you don't have any major issues, certainly more often than that if you are having an issue. And then my last category to focus on is specialty appointments. So this list could be extremely lengthy. Here's a few of them for you to consider. Maybe you need to see a cardiologist, which is a heart doctor, or a pulmonologist, which is a lung doctor, a nephrologist, kidney doctor, endocrinologist, they deal with endocrine problems like diabetes and thyroid issues. Maybe you need to go to your oncologist, the cancer doctor, or your hematologist that deals with blood disorders. So that's just kind of a brief list, but there are many, many specialty doctors. And if you go to one and you're due for an appointment, make sure you schedule it. So this is the challenge. Make yourself a list right now before you disappear from my podcast and make sure that you schedule them before the week is out. So give yourself one week to get whatever appointments you need scheduled, scheduled. Don't let it slip or you might wait too long. And, you know, remember once again that routine screenings and checkup prevent problems in certain cases. And if they can't be prevented, they can treat them promptly. So you don't want to miss out on that. Okay, and our final segment today is about randomized controlled trials. 
So maybe you've heard of this, maybe you haven't, but I've done several podcasts uh, in the last couple months where I've discussed the topic of vaping. Uh, It's an alternative to cigarette smoking. And my latest discussion on vaping spurred quite a discussion on Twitter about the benefits, the barriers, and also what type of research is available or currently being done about vaping. So my purpose today is not to discuss vaping. However, I did realize by listening to this discussion that the topic of randomized control trials, also known as RCTs, came up and it was apparent to me that not everyone really clearly understood what they were or why they are important. And as someone who has personally studied a great deal of research and performed my own research, I do know a lot about various types of research methods. And today I'm only going to focus on one kind, the randomized controlled trials. I'm going to try to put it in plain English so it's easy to understand. So if there's any research experts out there listening, this may seem a little bit watered down, but I'm intentionally doing that to make it easy to understand for people who don't make a career out of research. And there's certainly more information available if anyone wants it. Okay, so getting started, randomized controlled trial, the definition is important to start with. It is a type of experiment which attempts to decrease prejudice, bias, or favoritism when testing a new treatment. So it's not always possible to do this type of research, but when it is, it's considered the gold standard for clinical trials. So what are clinical trials? Clinical trials are research studies done on human beings. And generally, we're talking about trying to answer questions that have to do with treatment of human beings, such as vaccinations or medications, drugs, how food affects the body, how supplements affect the body, or medical devices. So for example, I was just talking all about the benefits of tea. In some some cases, tea can be considered a supplement, right? So there might be randomized control trials done on different teas. You know, does this really prevent cancer? Does this really help with a certain type of ailment? So let's look a little bit further at this definition. So the first word is randomized. In a nutshell, random means that something is unknown ahead of time, right? You don't know what's going to happen. So, for example, if there was a study being done to see if drug A took pain away better than drug B or no drug at all, we could randomly assign participants to one of the three groups. As each participant kind of shows up, we could uh, randomly assign them to group A, B, or C, and C being no drug at all. However, it's randomization that people don't have a choice in, right? So they can't say, oh, I think I'd like to be in group B. No, they don't get a choice. They are just assigned. And usually the people do not know what group they're assigned to, and they call that blinding. So they are blind to knowing which treatment they're getting, A, B, or C. They all look the same. They're made to look the same so that people can't tell by looking that they are different. Sometimes you might hear the word double blind to indicate that neither the person giving or receiving the medication knows which group they were assigned to. So, you know, we may not know if you're getting a placebo, which is no drug at all, or if you're getting, um, you know, which drug we think is the most uh, effective. Um, So it's random and only the people who are courting the randomization know what group you're in. They do have to track somehow what group you're in so that they know that your results are to a certain group, Um, but they have a great deal of confidentiality available with that. So that was randomized. So I think we're all pretty familiar with the term random, you know, random act of kindness, uh, a random act of research. So the second part is controlled trial, and this means that the researchers are controlling what type of interventions or treatment people receive. So um, there is a clear decision, you know, these people are getting drug A, these people are getting drug B, these people are getting drug C, which is a placebo and no drug at all. That's, there is control involved in that. Um, So even though that might seem obvious, that's what that part of the word means, randomized control trial. 
So before I go any further, I do want to say there's other types of research. Not all types of research involve this great detail. I don't want to get too deep into other types of research today. But, you know, for example, we could watch something happen, record it, and then later analyze it, and that would be considered research. We could also just have a discussion, and I could record and type up your responses, and that could be a type of research. We could have people fill out a questionnaire. You know, there's so many different kinds of research, and um, some involve more control than others. But when we're talking about making decisions about people's health care, we want the best that's available. We want that gold standard stuff that I had mentioned. So the best scientific evidence is going to come from randomized controlled trials. And that allows physicians and healthcare providers to really make the best recommendations possible on evidence-based research. And it's the most concrete proof type of things that we can get. Research is never able to prove something 100%, but it gives us good indications that, you know, this particular treatment really worked well with this particular population. So, you know, randomized control trials sound great, right? Well, there's problems with them too. Several problems, in fact. You know, for ethical reasons, not all studies can be randomized control trials. There are what we call vulnerable populations, pregnant women, prisoners, mentally disabled clients, and children are some great examples. And we cannot give them the ability to decide whether or not they can participate. They are not able to make those decisions in many cases. And if they are, they may feel coerced or they may be placing an unborn child at risk. So these type of studies cannot be done in all cases. Um, we do them when we can, but not every case is suitable for this. The second major drawback is they take a large amount of money time, resources, and that is not available to everyone. You know, not everyone is able to get a large sum of grant money and, and go running with it and have a large team of researchers. When I did my dissertation research, it was me and my pocketbook. There wasn't anyone else involved. So I had to come up with all the money, all the time, all the, the effort. Um, so you could see that large studies are great. They produce great results, but there's a big cost that is involved with that. Another problem with randomized controlled trials is that they may be required to stop early. So sometimes the results are either so good or so bad that the study cannot be completed. It could be dangerous to continue if we're seeing bad results, and it could be ethically wrong to not share the good results with everyone. If drug A is like doing incredible things, why are we going to keep people on drug B or no drug? You know, so that would not be ethically sound decision. So that's another time. Sometimes we can't complete them, even though they're looking great, promising. Another big problem also is that you can't find enough participants. There may not be a lot of interest in certain studies. Sometimes the people that you're trying to study are not interested in doing anything that doesn't benefit them. And if you offer payment, that can sometimes coerce people to respond the way they think you want them to respond. Uh, so there are some problems with it. I'm not going to list any more. I think that's probably enough to give you a good idea. So for practical application, now that you know a little bit more about randomized control trials, the question is, how do they affect your life? So here's a few things I want you to think about. If you're ever asked to participate in a study, research study, randomized control trial, know that you're participating in an important process which helps physicians and other healthcare providers to make informed recommendations for treatments. So your participation could lead to benefiting either yourself, a family member, or a friend, or even some random person in the future. Also, know that there are ethical guidelines in place that protect participants. You know, years ago, I, I do admit there was unethical research going on, but we have put an end to that. That does not happen anymore. The participants are protected as much as able in these studies. The third point is other types of research are valid and they are worthwhile, but they just don't give us results that are, that are as strong. So we just have to keep that in mind. You know, maybe we were not able to randomize the results. Maybe we had to give all the people in one facility one treatment and all the people in another facility another treatment. That wasn't random, but there were still differences in the groups that we could study. So keep that in mind. They're all good. 
They're just not as strong. You may have to be patient as more results come in. And this is what I found with the vaping population. They want more studies with more results right now. We're gonna get those randomized controlled trial results going. Well, the problem is it takes time. You know, it takes time to do the study. It takes time, especially long-term studies where we're seeing, you know, how you are today and then how you are in six months and how you are in a year and two years. You need years for that to happen, you know, so that sometimes takes a lot of time to keep that in mind. And then one thing I haven't really mentioned yet is that research studies cannot answer every question on a topic. Every study has one or just a few questions that it's designed to answer. And that's where all the resources in that study go to, to focus on. They focus on the one or a few questions that they're asking. They can't study everything. You know, so for example, if we're studying if something works, that's not the same as asking if people liked it, right? You know, for, for example, the vegetable spinach. It's very healthy for you. We know that it has a lot of positive benefits on the body. If we study the benefits, that's not the same as studying if everybody likes it or how many people choose to eat it because they, they enjoy it so much. So there are various ways to do studies and the question that you're asking is important. Okay, I have just two reflection questions for you today. The first one is, do you currently drink tea? If so, what kind do you enjoy most? And if not, are you interested in giving tea another try? Uh, or the first try if you haven't had tea before. And the second is, what type of doctor appointments do you need to schedule? And are you willing to make those appointments this week? So I invite you to leave comments in the comment section of the webpage or to, you could even go on our Facebook page um, and, and write some responses there. Just a few reminders as we wrap up, the podcast episodes are available for download on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Android, and RSS. So please, uh, I encourage you to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. And if you prefer, I have several other social media channels that you can check out. I, you have, I have a Twitter feed, Instagram, Pinterest, Google Plus uh, accounts. And also, um, most recently, I've started the Health Mentoring Moments on YouTube videos. Um, you can find links to everything that I have on my website, drterrywenner.com. So whatever you prefer, that's great. You know, if you, if you wanna hit the like button, share button, pin, whatever strikes your fancy is totally fine. Okay, so this is Dr. Terry Wenner. Together, we're gonna break through as many health barriers as possible and live happier, healthier lives. And until next time, enjoy each and every day you are given.